This is about major histocompatibility complex proteins and how their structures support their functions. Their functions are crucial to our immune defenses. What you are watching is a video captured from an interactive tutorial. Unlike the tutorial, the video is not interactive. You just have to sit back, watch, and listen. If you click any of the buttons or links that you'll see in the video, nothing will happen. Unfortunately, the interactive version of the tutorial doesn't work in the year 2020 due to changes in technology. Upgrading it to current technology is planned for the future. You can find this tutorial at molviz.org. That's M-O-L-V-I-Z dot org where you'll also find tutorials on many other molecules like antibody, hemoglobin, DNA, and most of these do work with today's technology. Before we get into the molecular structures, let's introduce the main players. We'll be talking about two classes of MHC. Class 1 MHC protein binds to CD8 a receptor found on certain T lymphocytes, also called cytotoxic T lymphocytes. With the exception of red blood cells, all cells in the body express MHC class 1 on their surfaces. A small portion of all the proteins in our cells is chopped up into small peptides by the proteasome. Peptides of the right length, 8 to 11 amino acids, are loaded into a groove or socket in the MHC class 1 protein, and the complex is then expressed on the surface of the cell. In a normal healthy cell, all the peptides in the MHC class 1 protein on the cell's surface are from self-proteins. But when the cell is infected by a pathogen that gets inside it, like a virus, then some of the peptides displayed on that cell's surface will be foreign. CD8 T lymphocytes are constantly scanning all the cells in our bodies. When they detect foreign peptides in MHC class 1 on the surface of a cell, various immune defenses are activated, which may include killing the infected cell. Viruses and other infectious microorganisms have developed all sorts of ways of evading our immune defenses. Some viruses and cancers make the infected cell unable to express normal amounts of MHC class 1. A cell that fails to express a normal level of MHC class 1 is attacked by natural killer cells. The interactive version of this tutorial begins with an introduction to the ways in which protein structures are represented on computers. This part of the tutorial has been superseded by a newer introduction, and you'll find a link to that in the text below this video. If you are unsure about how protein molecules are represented as backbone traces or ribbon cartoons, you may want to look at that introduction before continuing with this video. This video comes with a couple of quizzes to help you see whether you got the main points. Links to these quizzes are in the text below the video. We'll begin by looking at the overall structure of the extracellular portion of the MHC class 1 protein. The structures of the transmembrane and cytoplasmic domains have not been determined. Each of the three separate polypeptide chains here has a different color. The largest chain, called the alpha chain, is in light blue. The smaller salmon-colored chain is called beta-2 microglobulin. The green part at the top is the peptide, which is sitting in a groove in the alpha chain. Each of us has multiple genes for alpha chains called alleles. These provide different amino acid sequences for the groove in the alpha chain. 
thus enabling our alpha chains to accommodate the widest possible range of peptides. All the different alpha chains use the same invariant beta-2 microglobulin, shown here in the salmon color. The number of the view currently showing is at the lower left, and you can match that with the view button on the right and the corresponding color key and text. Here again is the largest chain, the alpha chain, in light blue, and the beta chain, also called beta-2 microglobulin, and the peptide up on the top fitting between two lips of a groove formed by the alpha chain. Moving to view 2, each of the domains in the alpha chain is now given a distinct color. The alpha chain consists of three separate domains. Beta-2 microglobulin is a separate domain in its own chain, and disulfide bonds are found in each of the immunoglobulin domains. This structure was solved before the days of genetic engineering by cutting the extracellular domains off with the enzyme papain. Here you can see where papain cut off the extracellular portion leaving the transmembrane and cytoplasmic domains attached to the cell. Inside cells, old proteins tagged with ubiquitin are chopped up into peptides by the proteasome. The MHC molecule makes no distinction between peptides from self-proteins versus peptides from foreign invading microorganisms. It is up to CD8 T lymphocytes to make that distinction. In view 3, the CD8 binding site is colored white. It is a surface loop on domain 3 of the alpha chain. In view 4, we see the same molecule as a solid object. Each atom is shown at its real size, its van der Waals radius. In view 5, the alpha chain is colored according to its secondary structure. The floor of the groove is a beta sheet. The lips of the groove are alpha helices. Both beta-2 microglobulin and the alpha-3 domain are immunoglobulin domains. View 6 colors each amino acid of the alpha chain by evolutionary conservation, according to a multiple sequence alignment. Beta-2 microglobulin is in translucent gray. Several amino acids in the CD8 binding loop are very highly conserved. The peptide is in green. In contrast, the lips of the groove are quite variable. This is because the multiple sequence alignment included different MHC alleles. The amino acid sequences of most of the lips has to be variable in order to accommodate a wide range of different peptides. On the other hand, amino acids at the position of the peptide's anchor residue and at the ends of the groove are highly conserved. The bottom two domains in this view, the beta-2 microglobulin chain and the 
alpha-3 domain are immunoglobulin-like domains. They're members of the immunoglobulin superfamily. You'll find lots more about immunoglobulin superfamily domains in the antibody tutorial available at molviz.org, M-O-L-V-I-Z dot org. Now that we've covered the extracellular domains of MHC, we'll look at the peptide binding cleft in a lot more detail. First, we'll hide the bottom two immunoglobulin-like domains and zoom in on the peptide binding cleft, which I've also called a socket or groove. Let's look at the peptide binding cleft from a number of different perspectives. With the MHC cleft shown as a backbone cartoon ribbon representation, the ends of the cleft appear to be open, but as you'll see, they are not. They're actually closed around the ends of the peptide. Here is where you can see that the ends of the cleft are closed. Now we've colored the MHC cleft by secondary structure, emphasizing again that the edges or lips of the cleft are alpha helices, while the floor is made of a beta sheet. Having analyzed the extracellular domains and the peptide binding cleft, now we'll take a closer look at the peptides themselves and how T lymphocytes can distinguish different peptides. Now the atoms in the peptide are colored by chemical element, gray for carbon, blue for nitrogen, and red for oxygen. The MHC cleft is colored by secondary structure. The peptide is a 9 amino acid fragment of the Sendai virus nucleoprotein. Some peptide amino acid side chains are buried in the bottom of the MHC cleft. These include tyrosine 6, here, and leucine 9, here, both pointing down in this view. Other peptide amino acid side chains are pointing up in this view. That is, they're exposed to solvent, they're not buried in the cleft, and they're accessible to T lymphocytes who are deciding whether the peptide is self or foreign. These include phenylalanine 1, here, and asparagine 5, here. In view 2, we've changed the peptide to an 8-amino acid 
peptide fragment from vesicular stomatitis virus nucleoprotein. This peptide is able to fit in this particular MHC class 1 allele because it has exactly the same buried amino acid side chains in the same positions. These are called anchor residues. Just like the previous peptide, it has a tyrosine at this position and a leucine at the end here. These fit into anchor residue sockets formed by this particular MHC class 1 allele with highly conserved amino acids. On the other hand, the amino acid side chains that point up accessible to the T lymphocyte are very different. There is a positively charged arginine at position 1, a hydrophobic valine at position 4 in the middle, and a hydrophilic glutamine side chain near the end at position 6. View 3 shows only the two peptides superimposed on each other. First we'll hide the side chains to simplify the view and we see only the main chain or backbone atoms. Notice that the ends of the peptides match perfectly because they're held in place by the closed ends of the cleft. However, the top peptide is one amino acid longer than the bottom peptide. Therefore, the top peptide must bulge out in the middle. Now we'll look at only the side chains by themselves. The three larger side chains exposed to the T lymphocyte are all different from each other, while the two anchor residues are exactly the same. Finally, we'll compare the two peptides from the T lymphocytes perspective. Both peptides are in exactly the same MHC allele cleft structure. But from the T lymphocytes perspectives, the two peptides look strikingly different. Only one of the peptides has an exposed positive charge. The exposed polar residues are in different positions and so are the nonpolar residues. A common main chain backbone runs down the core of each peptide. We've completed our tour of MHC class 1, so now we'll turn to class 2 MHC. Presentation of peptides by MHC class 2 is crucial for CD4 T helper lymphocytes to participate in our defenses against infection. After all, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, obliterates much of our immune defenses by killing CD4 T cells. Whereas class 1 MHC is expressed on all cells in the body, class 2 is expressed mostly on specialized antigen-presenting cells, such as dendritic cells and macrophages. Rare individuals are unable to make MHC class 2 due to a genetic defect. This is a life-threatening immunodeficiency. More information about deficiencies in MHC, both classes 1 and 2, is linked below the video. So now we'll turn from class 1 MHC to class 2 MHC. Unlike class 1 MHC, class 2 MHC does not contain beta 2 microglobulin. 
Instead, it has two chains of approximately equal size, each of which makes up half of the peptide binding cleft. The peptide here is 13 amino acids long, a fragment from influenza hemagglutinin. Here you can see clearly how the peptide binding cleft is made up of two separate chains. Class II MHC can accommodate peptides of 13 amino acids length up to about 20. This is because the ends of the cleft are open, allowing the peptide to hang out. Each of the MHC class II chains is made up of two domains, a cleft-forming domain and an immunoglobulin-like domain, the latter being at the bottom of this view. There is also some glycosylation. As for MHC class 1, also in class 2, the floor of the peptide binding cleft and the two Ig domains are composed of beta sheets, while the lips of the cleft are alpha helices. Here we're comparing class 1 MHC on the top with class 2 MHC on the bottom. You can see the longer peptide in the cleft in class 2 at the bottom. This concludes our brief tour of class 2 MHC. If you'd like to take a little online quiz covering the main points of this tutorial, there's a link to one down below the video. The online quiz gives you immediate feedback on your answers. Also below the video is a link to a set of more open-ended questions, unlike the multiple choice type questions in the online quiz. And there are also suggestions for teachers and educators. The interactive tutorial from which this video was captured was created by Frieda Reichsman and Eric Martz. Eric did the video capture, and this is Eric speaking.